Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, we have Miss Page asking questions this morning. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Dilly. Good morning. The strategy of focusing on the old case of Picton, it was something of a legal sleight of hand. Would you accept that? No. You ostensibly focused the claim on the signed cash accounts, but meanwhile, you called witnesses to say that Horizon was working correctly. We called witnesses, as far as I recall, that covered both cash accounts and their experiences with the Horizon computer system. Well, let's look at the judgment. Um, it's at poll 00004325. And if we look at page five, please. The end of paragraph 11, uh, what we get is a sentence that begins since. Do you see that? Yes. Since Mr. Castleton accepts the accuracy of his entries in the accounts and the correctness of the arithmetic, and since the logic of the system is correct, the conclusion is inescapable that the Horizon system was working properly in all material respects, and that the shortfall of 22,963.34 is real, not illusory. And he then goes on to say, I shall nevertheless consider the points made by Mr. Castleton in relation to the reliability of the Horizon system, and he proceeds to uh, raise them and then dismiss them, in effect. Yes. So the result of calling your witnesses was that the judge found that the Horizon system was working properly? At Mr Castleton's branch, he uh, was satisfied from the witnesses of fact that, that they had not been able to, and Chambers in particular, that her investigation hadn't uncovered an issue with the Horizon system at his branch. And indeed, um, that was something that eventually was more or less pleaded. If we can just take that document down and look at the reply and defence to counterclaim, which is, uh, my reference for that is LCAS 0000190. Um, and this is the re-amended reply and defence to counterclaim with a statement of truth signed by you, Mr Dilley, yes? I can't see the statement of truth, but if I've signed it, then I shall accept that I have. Yes, it's on page three. I don't think we need to necessarily go to it. Okay. Um, but if we scroll down, well, you can certainly see it if yes, you like. Yes, I have signed that. There we are. Yeah. Um, and then on page one, if we go down to paragraph three, please, we can say, we can see it says, with respect to paragraphs five and six of the defence, Fujitsu Services have looked at the claimant's computer system and have confirmed that the losses recorded by the defendant were caused by a difference between the physical transactions that actually occurred and were recorded on the system by the defendant or his assistant as taking place and the cash in hand that was declared by the defendant relating to those transactions. And accordingly, those losses were not caused by the claimant's systems, software or hardware. So we have that there, and that is um, said to be from Fujitsu Services having looked at the claimant's computer system. What evidence did you base that on? My recollection is we had, in, in, insofar as the computer system was concerned, we had two witnesses from Fujitsu, Ann Chambers and Andy Dunks. There was also 
uh, a gentleman called Andrew Wise, who uh, worked for the post office. Who's post office? He was, yeah. So um, they were witnesses who were able to talk to the system. Do you say that Anne Chambers and or Andrew Dunks looked at the claimant's computer system and confirmed that the losses recorded by the defendant were caused by etc. Do you say that's what they said? It's 17 odd years ago, and so I would have to be, you know, I can't recall everything they, they said now, but what is before the inquiry today is our note of what was said at the trial. Um, so the inquiry has that information. This was really the sleight of hand at work, wasn't it, Mr Dilley? Not at, not at all. This case was not about signed cash accounts, was it? It was about saying that the Horizon system worked and making Mr Castleton an example, wasn't it? No. Putting his head on a spike, so to speak. Not at all. Let's turn to the subject of disclosure. Um, you spoke about the distinction between disclosure of the Fujitsu product generally and disclosure of issues at the Marine Branch, uh, Marine Drive Branch. Um, going back to the start of matters, following the conference with council, and uh, I took you to the note of that yesterday, remember the conference which wasn't held with post office and then Mr. Beza wrote a letter about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. In that letter, um, if we go to poll 00071081, Um, at page one, um, if we scroll down a little, and at the bottom there, mm -hmm. one other point raised by Richard was the integrity of the Fujitsu product generally. Mm -hmm. Just to confirm, I understand that Royal Mail Stroke Post Office know of no issues with the Fujitsu system and are confident that it operates correctly. Please discuss this with me if you have a different, and I think it's going to say view. Mm -hmm. So at the start there, uh, Mr Morgan anyway, felt that it was important to look at the integrity of the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and did you disagree with that? No. So you not did at, think not, it... not not at Mr. Castleton's branch, and that's what that's why we went to see Fujitsu. Why we'd gone to see them in June, we'd gone through the points put in Mr. Castleton's Part 18 response. Yes, hold on just a grade. minute. I'm trying to get to one specific point here, which is that Richard Morgan, obviously, said that he raised the issue of the integrity of the Fujitsu product generally. And he seriously seems to have considered that to be something that um, needed to be looked into. Did you disagree with that? I would have wanted to have been told by post office if it didn't consider the Fujitsu system to be robust. But when I had Whenever I had conversations with them, as the evidence that I've put in and the attachments amply demonstrate, the message we got is that post office were confident in their system. I see. Well, um, then let's look at some more specific matters. The Tivoli event log... Um, which had not been disclosed before trial, but with, which Ms Chambers referred to in her evidence. Mm -hmm. um, that, in effect, 
not intentionally, but that in effect revealed a failure of disclosure, didn't it? In the sense that something which she referred to in evidence had not been previously disclosed, and she obviously felt the need to refer to it, and it had not previously been disclosed. So in that sense, there was a failure of disclosure. Is that fair? I'm thoughtful about the Tivoli event logs. You have to disclose something in civil litigation that could help your case, that could harm your case. Uh, when, when those disclosure rules were in place, they've changed now. Or, or your opponent's case. The Tivoli event logs didn't help post office's case, nor did they harm it, nor did they help Mr Castleton's case. So for the sake of argument, we disclosed them, but, uh, and, and I was content to do so to avoid the argument, but actually uh, they became a non-issue. All right, so you don't accept that that was a failure despite her referring to them in her evidence? I, I, I would have uh, preferred to have had them earlier and disclosed them earlier, but I don't know. I don't think that was a disclosure failing. Let's um, also then just consider the message store. Um, that's something which in this inquiry we've become used to. It's a, um, a, a very large... Uh, set of data, isn't it, that encompasses all the transactions that take place in, in all the branches, but certainly in, in this case in Mr Castleton's branch, yes? Um, I have no reason to doubt what you're saying. All right. Well, um, if, you, if we look at your witness statement, um, you deal with this at paragraph 335. It's WITN 0466... 0100. Uh, paragraph 335, which I think is on page 149. Ah, yes, so... Um, 335 starts earlier in uh, the document, but what we're looking at here is you quoting from a covering letter uh, which came subsequent to the original disclosure um, because you uh, wanted to make sure that Mr Castleton had certain items which hadn't been in the original disclosure. Is that a fair summary? Yes, and on the 22nd of uh, prior to the 22nd of November, we'd been uh, providing Mr. Castleton's solicitors with disclosure, both, both in May and, and afterwards. But we put a, a name, a name on it, on the 22nd of November. Uh, and I think I said to Fujitsu, what, what is it? Is it a, um, you know, is it a a device, how would, you, how would you describe it? And they said it was best described as the message store. All and right. It's that point in time we put, a, we put a name to it. Yes, I see. And so what you said in your letter was, the message store audit trail, referred to as document one, contains details of everything that is recorded at the counter by Horizon. Mm -hmm. It is located at Fujitsu. Mm -hmm. The message store itself is of considerable size, and we believe that the post office has obtained from Fujitsu and disclosed everything from the message store that falls to be disclosed pursuant to CPR 31.6. Mm -hmm. However, if you seek any further information from it, please contact Brian Pinder of Fujitsu Services to make an appointment directly, mm -hmm. and copy us in. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pinder is at Lovelace Road, etc. He has stated that you would need to specify precisely what information that you require from the message store, mm -hmm. as it can take some time, hours to days, to retrieve from the servers, although this would greatly depend upon the information required. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you talk about the court ordering of inspection. Mm -hmm. um, in effect, what you said was, you can look at the message store, but it's going to be nigh on impossible for you to get anything useful out of it. I also say 
we believe that the post office has obtained from Fujitsu and disclosed everything from the message store that falls to be disclosed. But we didn't have any objection to Mr. Castleton looking at it. All right. Let's go back a bit um, and uh, talk about the letter that Lee Castleton's solicitors wrote about week 42. We touched on it yesterday. Uh, this is the letter where Mr. Castleton had gone through the transactions for week 42, and he had said that he felt that there were missing transactions. Yes? Um, you originally wrote to Penny Thomas at Fujitsu. I did. And you eventually got back a response from Gareth Jenkins and Anne Chambers. Yes? So if we could have a look at that. Um, it's WBON We can see at the top there that it's, um, the author is Gareth Jenkins, but in fact he does refer to uh, Miss Chambers in that first introductory paragraph there. Do you see that? Yes. And it says that the two of them have undertaken an analysis of all transactions that took place in cash account week 42. And this was um, on the, in September of 2006. Now, if we go down to analysis undertaken, it's pretty dense reading, but um, I would like to just put on record what they said. Uh, the initial set of data obtained was the extract from the transaction log that was submitted to Post Office Limited as supporting evidence, ARQ 421. Subsequently, a complete extract of audit data for the period concerned was obtained. This included non-transactional data, including opening figures, and the electronic cash account information, which was subsequently submitted to Post Office Limited's back-end systems, and represents the same information as was printed on the paper cash account, which Mr. Castleton signed at the time to indicate that it was correct. So, just pausing there, in order to do this work, they had obtained a complete extract of audit data for the period concerned, yes? Yes. That was not disclosed, was it? Well, we disclosed all of the transaction logs and the event logs. Yes, what... that's covered in the paragraph above, which says that we initially looked at the extract from the transaction log. What, what I don't now recall discussing with them is, is well, I don't recall going through this document with Fujitsu. Let's I, carry I, on, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I can see, uh, you know, the cash account information which they refer to in that paragraph, second paragraph on the analysis undertaken, for example, um, the cash accounts had been provided uh, by way of recollection. Yes, certainly the cash accounts, but mm. not this complete extract of audit data. Yes? Well, we did disclose, didn't we, the, the existence of the message store. You did. And we produced everything from it that uh, we thought was disclosable. Let's go down to uh, the next paragraph. And it says... Um, the figures examined have been compared with both the electronic cash account information retrieved and also copies of the paper cash accounts for week 42 and also weeks 41 and 43 held by Post Office Limited. Mm -hmm. 
This check identified a transaction missing mm -hmm. from the ARQ421 data for mm -hmm. a value of 92p on mm -hmm. the 12th of January. This transaction did not include its start time, mm -hmm. brackets, a known fault mm -hmm. that occasionally happens. Mm -hmm. And so the ARQ extraction process ignored it. However, it would not have been ignored by the accounting functions at the counter, and a report would have been generated that night as part of the overnight checks. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this report is not audited and so is not available for examination. Mm -hmm. However, we do not believe that this report is material to the case. Mm -hmm. This was a report in relation to a known fault in the system. Mm -hmm. This was not investigated or disclosed, was it? Well, I'm told in that document that the report is not available for examination and that it's not material to the case. Um, this the, is coming this, from this, Fujitsu marking their own homework, isn't it? Well, they know uh, you have to disclose documents that are relevant to the case. How do they know that? Because I'd written to them on the 22nd of November 2005 I'd explained all the details of the case, what it was about, what was going on. They knew that there was a civil claim. They knew the points Mr. Castleton was putting. And I went to see them. And I Did went through the points that Mr. Castleton was putting to them. They were well aware that civil litigation was going on. Did and you... I, I, sorry. Did you explain to Anne Chambers, after receiving this report, her disclosure obligations? I don't recall... No. Well, let's go down to the next paragraph. Having done that, a copy of the reference data in use at all branches at that time was obtained mm -hmm. that defines how each transaction at the branch maps onto the various lines of the cash account. Mm -hmm. This reference data was then used to summarise all the transactions according to where on the cash account report they would appear, thus enabling the cash account table totals to be reconstructed. Mm -hmm. So, in order to analyse week 42's transactions, mm -hmm. the people at Fujitsu obtained a complete extract of the audit data and a copy of the reference data in use at branches. Neither of those were produced and uh, disclosed to Mr Castleton, were they? I don't have anything to add to what... I've already said on this. So, um, Mr. Castleton's attempt to analyse week 42 was um, clearly not going to work, was it? Because well, he didn't have the same information that the people at Fujitsu had used to do that analysis, did he? Well, there is actually one further point. I spoke to Mr. Turner, who was Mr. Castleton's solicitor at, then at Roe Cohen's solicitors on the phone. I told him about this analysis that had been done. We had a phone call. Well, we'll come to, to that me, phone note, actually, um, okay. before we start talking about it. Let's uh, do that. Uh, OK. Well, uh, hang on a minute. This is becoming, if I may say so, a detailed re-examination of one particular point, a detailed re-examination in this inquiry of one particular point. And, Ms Page, with a little latitude either way, you were... Um, time slot was 40 minutes, which is um, significantly... Uh, <clears throat> you have had longer than that already. So I, I, I think we need to confine this, if we may. But as I see it, um, Mr Dilley, th there seems little doubt that some, at least, of these documents were not disclosed. Your answer to that is that you didn't think they were disclosable. I, I may or may not, depending on, on where this all takes me, have to make up my mind about that. But that's the reality of this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and uh, Mr Castleton's... I, I, I put this to Mr Castleton, solicitors, 
Um, so, no doubt in due course, I, 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 I will be shown the relevant document if I need to be, yeah, but and, it and, doesn't have to be in cross-examination. Well, Mr Castleton solicitors told me then that it wasn't this week that they were concerned about and, and had... Are um, you actually telling me that you can remember um, particular conversations with Mr Castleton solicitors now? I've got... Uh, an attendance note that shows I spoke to Mr Castleton's solicitor about this and, he, and notwithstanding that they'd written to us in June about week 42 and we'd commissioned this work um, so are you he then said it was that, week 49 that was the issue so are, are you saying that um, you explained to Mr Castleton's solicitors exactly what work Mr Jenkins and Ms Chambers had done and he said, oh, well, fair enough, but you don't need to disclose that or something along those I, lines. I, I don't recall the fine details, that level of detail of the conversation, but I did explain that we had looked at it, that they'd been through it, and that they were satisfied with it. And that's when... Um, he's, and, I, and, I t and I did take him through that, and that's when he said it was week 49, and I was left thinking, well, what was the point of all that then? Well, let me be clear about what you say you're saying that Mr Jenkins, who hadn't made a witness statement, as far as I'm aware, no. together with Ms Chambers, who certainly had made a witness statement, though I'm not sure of the chronology of whether it had been served by the time of this conversation, you told them that they had carried out an investigation and they were satisfied, in effect, that as a result of it, that no information had come to light which assisted Mr Castleton's case. Is that it, a summary? It, it, it is, save that I can't remember whether that I told him it was Mr Jenkins and Ms. Ch Mrs Chambers that had done that, well, but I would have said it was Fujitsu. Would you desist to bring up the note, sir? Well, uh, yes, but then I think, as I've said, Ms Page, you will have to persuade me that you've got any time left after we've done that. Um, it's poll... 0006904 and if we uh, look at it it says in paragraph one I referred him to his letter that's the letter where they raised the issue of uh, cash accounts for weeks 41 and 42 yeah. And you um, deal with the fact that they say that the uh, figures don't stack up. I don't propose to read through it all. Presumably this is something that you've read, yes? Um, sorry, did you sorry, Ms Page, are you addressing me or the witness? Then? No, I was, I was sorry, I was talking to Mr Dilly. You've read this, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, fine, thanks. Yeah. So, sorry, this attendance note? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, where do you say that you explained to Mr Turner that there had been an analysis done by Fujitsu of the cash accounts? I would have done so at the time, but it is not recorded in this note. I see. So you say that although you didn't record it in this note, you told him that, and you can remember that from 2006. <laughs> My... Uh, my memory of that is distant, but I would have said that to him because it was not me that had done the analysis. Are you prepared to take it from me that there is an email which shows that the report we were just looking at from Mr Chambers and Ms Jenkins was not disclosed? Yes. And that this is the only phone note that I've found which deals with week one and your discussions about that with Mr Turner? Yes. Well, sir, um, my point um, on that is finished. I, I do have other material. I, I know that it is, there is a lot of um, underestimation on the part of council as to how long it will take to deal with matters, but I, I do have quite a lot more material. I, I, I well, crave your I, indulgence. I, well, I, I think, actually, that... Um, and this is a general remark... Um, uh, which applies not just to you, Ms. Page, but to everyone who asks questions, including me, for that matter. Um, 
the written material is there to be read and digested by me. And um, as a generalization, let me just put it like that. Um, after the event uh, elaborations of the written material, especially when they're after the event by very many years, don't tend to impress me wherever they come from compared with what was written contemporaneously. All right? Um, would it make matters easier if I were to put something in writing with the other documents I wanted to take Mr Dilly to? When you come, or when your team comes to address me, <coughs> no doubt you will address me orally and in writing at length about your best points, if I can put it in that way, Ms Page. And I'm sure that you will refer to these um, issues uh, if you think them important. And that, again, goes for every other uh, recognised legal representative and, for that matter, counsel to the inquiry. The plain fact is that um, if we were to seek to investigate every point which every recognised legal representative thought important in oral evidence, there would be a very, 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 very long inquiry, and I, that is to be avoided. I do understand that, sir. Um, this is an important witness for Mr Castleton. And, I understand that. And, and there are quite a number of other matters I'd like to have put. If I may, I'll put them in writing, sir. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I think in order to preserve the um, re reasonable progress of the inquiry, if you put those in writing to me, and I think it appropriate either to seek Mr Dilly's further answers in the light of that, uh, either in writing or orally, then I will consider that. But I don't think we can just go open-ended today, so to speak. Thank you, sir. So let's have um, the next uh, set of questions coming from Ms Dobbin, I think. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr Dilley, my name is Claire Dobbin. I represent Gareth Jenkins. I want to ask you about three topics, if I may. First topic, the meeting that took place at Fujitsu on the 6th of June 2006. And I'm going to ask if we can please bring up POL 000 -71427. Thank you. Um, Mr Dilley, this is a document that you've seen before. It's just that the reference number is different. Thank you. In terms of what was discussed... Thank you. In terms of what was discussed at that meeting, I think we can see if we look at the first page, we looked at number one yesterday, but if we look at two, there was some discussion about Horizon Worked, yes? That's at paragraph two. Mm -hmm. And I think we can tell, if we go over the page, that that was a fairly high-level discussion, correct? Yes. And if we carry on, we can see that there was then discussion of the specific topics mm -hmm. that had been referred to in Mr Castleton's Part 20 reply, correct? Mm -hmm. And if we look, perhaps if we take, for example, the first topic, non-communication between the PCs, mm -hmm. and we look at the note, mm -hmm. we can see, for example, that it was suggested that the transaction logs could be retrieved, yes? Yes. And again, if we, I'm not going to go through every one of these, Mr Dilley, but if we just go through, for example, and look through at screen freezing, mm -hmm. which was dealt with on the next page, Yes. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the final paragraph at that section, do you see the one that reads at the end of the session, mm -hmm. it's all communicated? Mm -hmm. And again, we see reference to it being possible, though it might be difficult, to look at the recovery session in the audit trails, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. 
And again, if we just go over the page, we can see that the discussion ended with the sixth of the topics, balance snapshots, yes? Mm -hmm. And then the discussion moved on, didn't it, to the investigation that had been carried out by Mrs. Anne Chambers mm -hmm. the year before, yes? Mm -hmm. And we've already seen, I think, that she was able to say at the conference that in terms of the analysis she had carried out, she couldn't see a systems reason to explain the discrepancy. Is that right? That's right. All right. What that looks like, Mr. Dilly, as, or how it appears, is that that was a discussion, essentially, about how the component parts of Horizon worked in relation to those topics mm -hmm. that Mr. Castleton had set out in his Part 20 reply. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. And suggestion as to some of the other material that could be looked at in relation to that. Is that right? Yes. And presumably that was the first post or the first consideration of the issues that you would consider in further detail as part of the process of taking witness statements from those people who you thought you might call in the trial process. Not entirely. We'd written to Fujitsu on uh, as I've mentioned, on the 22nd of November and told them what was happening. But at that time, we didn't have Mr. Castleton's Part 20, uh, Part 18 response, so his allegations were e e even vaguer at that point in time. And we'd asked them to produce an expert report that we never got. Yes. So this was your first meeting, wasn't it? This was the first yes. physical meeting that we that I had had with him. Yes. So can we just be clear about the letter that you're referring to? That was the letter that had been sent in November 2005, the previous Sorry, year. Sorry, 2005 via Mr Samuel. That's the letter I'm referring yes. to. Yeah. And you heard nothing from Fujitsu since then, correct? I, I hadn't, and I turned the page on our correspondence file before I came to give evidence, and I... I just can't see any response from them. Yes. So again, just returning to the point, this was the first meeting that you had with those mm -hmm. individuals who might be able to help you in this case, correct? Yes. And you expected, following on from that meeting, that there would then be the iterative process of taking witness statements from them, yes? Yes, but I'd flagged that in advance as well to Brian hinder Fujitsu that we would want to take a statement. Quite so. And I think it's right then that based on your understanding of the meeting, you drafted a witness statement for Mr Jenkins, correct? Yes. And we have a version of that witness statement, and perhaps we can call it up. It's at FUJ 001 I think you've been provided with this, Mr. Dilley, haven't you? I have, but I don't recall seeing these annotations at the time. And I've checked our, certainly I've checked our correspondence file to see whether we were provided it, and I couldn't see it on there. That doesn't mean that we weren't, but I just can't remember seeing these responses and think that I did not. It's quite an important document, isn't it? Yep. Can we just look at it and see why it's important? So if we look at page one of the document, we can see, can't we, that he sets out how he's made his annotations, correct? Mm -hmm. And he says that he's highlighted parts of it that he wanted to emphasise. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Now, I don't have time to go through every single comment that he made. No. And I'm going to pick it up at paragraph 16. But if there's anything that you want me to draw to attention, then please do so. Mm -hmm. So if we look at paragraph 16... So, first of all, you had drafted for Mr. Jenkins your understanding of how dual account, double accounting yeah. worked, yes? And he's saying that's, what, that's not what he meant. Exactly, and I think Correct. you had understood that there was a physical document that was the analogue of every Horizon transaction, correct? Correct. And what he was setting out was that you had gotten that pretty much fundamentally wrong, yes? Yeah, he, yeah. he was saying double entry accounting means something else. But but but, um, I don't think he's saying that there wasn't a corresponding physical document for uh, a transaction. Absolutely, he goes I, on. I think at the end of that part of his comment to explain to you, for example, that Paul would have some of the physical documentation in terms of a reconciliation process. Correct. Co correct. And if we go over the page, please. And it's right to say that you had asked Mr. Jenkins a series of questions on mm -hmm. this witness statement mm -hmm. as well, hadn't you? Correct. And you asked him whether or not there was any data to show whether or not the computer terminals mm -hmm. didn't communicate with each mm -hmm. other. And he explained to you about the EOD check that was made at the end of the day, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And he went on to explain to you that the audit trail would have information about that mm -hmm. and that that was something he could check for you, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And he also explained that it wasn't in the data that he had looked at as yet, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. And if we go on again to look at paragraph 17, you'd asked him another question about what the postmaster would see. Do you see that? Yes. And again, he said to you, didn't he, he would need to investigate that further. Yes. But he could give you a rough idea, correct? Correct. And again, if we look at paragraph 19. And I just want to draw your attention to this paragraph. Um, you had asked about what's the transaction log, and again, he explained to you what that was. What that was, and he had already said, hadn't he, at the meeting that that was something that could be obtained. And, uh, and we did disclose transaction yes. logs, yes. I'm quite sure you did, but okay. I think the point is that at a very early stage, he was pointing to the availability of these materials, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And again, if we go over the page, please, to paragraph 23. And this is consideration of onch. And again, if we look at the very final part of that paragraph that starts, I think there may be some confusion here. Mr. Jenkins mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. trying to clarify to you, wasn't he, what he understood Mr. Castleton's case, or what, in fact, Mr. Castleton was saying, correct? Yes, correct. And again, on paragraph 26, and this is still on onch, Thank you. And again, we can see he's highlighted again an explanation that he was giving to you about the final report, correct? Yes. And if we follow his words, he in fact tells you that the way that you had put it was too strong. He did. And I'm going to move on, if I may, to paragraph 35. which was the section on balance snapshots. Mm -hmm. And you had set out and referred, I think, to some of the documents mm -hmm. in respect of this. Mm -hmm. We can see that from mm -hmm. 36A, Gareth, this is document three. 
And what he said underneath that was, I'll need to carry out a more detailed analysis to explain exactly what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. And again, at the very final paragraph in that, on that page, he referred again to the fact that he hadn't examined the detail yes. of the documents. And he was saying to you, I think, in fact, that the documents that you had referred to weren't, in fact, complete. Is that correct? Yeah. And then, if I may, Mr. Dilley, if we go over the page to paragraph 38, what you had drafted for Mr. Jenkins was mm -hmm. the statement, there are no grounds for believing mm -hmm. that the problems Mr. Castleton says he experienced with mm -hmm. his computer would have caused either theoretical or real losses. Yes. And then there was the reference to the reconciliation of paperwork, yes. which he had already corrected. Yeah. And we can see that what Mr. Jenkins said was, not sure I can agree to this without looking more closely Correct. at what has gone on. Correct. And it's for all of those reasons, isn't it, that that was an important document? It was an important document, and it's a much more measured document than the information provided to me in the physical meeting that we had. That document couldn't fairly be described, could it, as Mr Jenkins having an answer for everything, could it? That document couldn't, no. no. That's how you characterised his approach, didn't you, in your witness statement? In, yes, in the June meeting, when we met Mr Jenkins, and I, my recollection of this is distant, he was very bullish, very confident, um, very knowledgeable about the system, and you have to listen to the words and the language people use and the way they say it. And I left that meeting with the sense that Fujitsu, as a, as a whole, not just Mr. Jenkins, but him in particular, were really confident about the operation of the system at that branch. So there's two things about that, Mr. Dilley. First, it may be that your memory of the meeting is faulty, given that it happened so long ago. That may be. However, I record quite close to the meeting that that was my memory of it. Well, the second point is that it may be that your understanding of what was being discussed at the meeting was incomplete because, as I've already said, this was the first meeting, the first point in the process whereby the evidence and your understanding would be developed by the process of taking witness statements. It's, it's fair to say that this document shows that there was a um, bigger picture, but I left the June meeting with a a very clear impression from Fujitsu, really clear. And I recorded that at the time. Uh, it's in emails, it's in my evidence, but that's the impression I got. You accept, don't you, that the way you characterised Mr Jenkins' evidence in, or sorry, Mr Jenkins' approach in your witness statement mm -hmm. at paragraph 179, mm -hmm whereby you said he had an answer for everything. You accept, having seen this document, that that can't stand as a general observation. I... Uh, I believe... I, I don't actually... At the meeting... At the meeting... He had an answer for all the allegations, and that's what I mean at paragraph 179. I'm not talking about, at paragraph 179, this document. Yes. So my, my observation of my understanding of what he was telling me at that meeting was really strong. Right. 
So notwithstanding the fact that we know that at the meeting reference was made to the further material that could be looked at mm -hmm. in respect of what Mr. Castleton was saying, mm -hmm. first of all, you, you still maintain, do you, that that was the, that that was the impression given to you? Yes. And then second, my question was actually this. As a matter of general observation mm -hmm. about Mr. Jenkins' approach, do you accept that what you said at paragraph 179 can't stand? Looked at in light of his witness statement and the comments he made, Mr. Dilley. My... Um what I accept is that my paragraph 179, in which I use the words, Mr. Jenkins had an answer for each of the allegations, that refers directly to his approach at that meeting. This draft statement is much more measured than how he was at that meeting. Notwithstanding that you had asked Mr. Jenkins a number of questions, mm -hmm and that he was in a position, obviously, to help you mm -hmm. with how Horizon worked. Why is it that you're saying you're not sure if you saw this statement or? I don't remember everything from this case quite clearly, but I do have a reasonably good memory. I can't remember seeing this that doesn't mean to say that I didn't. I've gone this week and turned the page of our correspondence file, page by page, to see whether I got an email from Mr. Pindle or Mr. Jenkins attaching this, and I couldn't find one there. So do I 100% rule out that I didn't see this? No. But do I believe I saw this? No. Why wouldn't you have pursued it and wanted to, to check what Mr. Jenkins had said, particularly in response to your questions? This uh, ultimately moved on. In August 2006, I spent a lot of time driving around, uh, physically meeting witnesses, interviewing them, taking notes of the meetings and developing witness statements of fact. Council became... Uh, once he saw how the draft witness statements of fact were shaping up, he became happier with the case. I sent to him the draft statement I'd written for Mr. Jenkins, and there were two points that counsel uh, had on that. One uh, was that because we've got these witness statements of fact, we felt that we no longer needed it. And the second was that Mr. Jenkins' evidence was really opinion evidence. Yes. And we were alive, and council was alive to that, and I was alive to that. And so, uh, uh, so, sorry. No, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologise, Mr. Dilley. So really, is what you're saying that because you had decided that you would instruct an expert, what Mr. Jenkins said in that wit said in response to your questions or any comments that he had made on that witness statement really went by the wayside? Yes. I don't think you spoke to Mr. Jenkins to explain to him why you didn't want a witness statement from him. I don't recall speaking to him uh, to say that, no. Um, could we please bring up FUJ Mr. Dilley, you may have come to realise, I don't know if this is a Fujitsu thing, whereby people set out emails they've been sent in the body of an email and then reply to them. If you're familiar with this, you might be able to tell 
that what Mr. This is an email from Mr. Jenkins, but he set out in the body of it an email that was sent to him from Mr. Pinder. Mm -hmm. Do you follow mm -hmm. what that how it's set out? So we can see Mr. Pinder said to him, just been chasing Stephen up, re your mm -hmm. attendance, mm -hmm. and any matters still outstanding for us, I think that's a post office account, as follows, and then he says, my words. He states that although you would probably make a good witness, it's for evidential reasons that you cannot be called, to do with evidence of opinion, expert evidence, and real evidence, etc., etc., complicated legal issues, nothing to do with personalities. Mm -hmm. And we can see how Mr. Jenkins replies, fine, I won't try and understand what that means. Mm -hmm. So I think that we can tell from that, can't we, that you must have given Mr. Pinder an explanation, mm -hmm. which he then tried to pass on to Mr. Jenkins, correct? Mm -hmm. So you never had that conversation with him whereby you explained the differences between the type of evidence that witnesses could give? Not as far as I recall. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Dilley. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Ms. Dobbin. Just, just one more question from me, Mr. Dilley, and it follows this issue mm -hmm. about the distinction between um, expert evidence and factual evidence, which mm -hmm. you've mentioned on a number of occasions. Ms. Chambers has told me at the inquiry, and also written, that she felt that she was being treated as an expert evidence. Uh, I, I simply want to ask you this. At any stage, I, before she gave evidence, mm -hmm. you explained to her the difference between a witness of fact and a witness of opinion. That may, may be answered by the attendance note, may possibly be answered by the attendance note of the meeting we had at Council's Chambers with four witnesses, I think it was in September 2006, of whom Anne Chambers was one. It may not be answered by that note, I, I can't recall. But but irrespective of whether it is or is not answered at that statement, I don't have a de direct recollection on the point, but I think it's um, entirely possible that it's something that we or council uh, would have said, that you, you're you here to um, make statements of fact and not opinion. I think in terms of Anne, Jenkins, uh, Anne Chambers' feeling, feelings uh, she we did regard her as being knowledgeable in her subject yes but she was asked to give um, uh, evidence of fact and what she had found at, at Mr Caston's branch and then latterly the calendar square branch I appreciate that in practice the um, distinction between fact and opinion may blur I, I'm used to that obviously um, I was more interested in my question in determining what you may have said to her about what would happen if she was asked questions which required her to offer an opinion. Yeah, I, 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 I can't recall specifics right. at this distance, I'm sorry. That's all right, thank you. Is that it, <laughs> Mr Blake? It is, sir. So if it assists just for the transcript um, for um, other uh, uh, any any parties' uh, submissions in due course. Um, the reference to that meeting on the 11th of September 2006 at Council's Chambers is poll 00069622. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dilley, for your very detailed witness statement and obviously your detailed evidence. I'm sorry that I caused you to um, return this morning. But what has occurred this morning convinced me that if I'd gone on, as I was urged to do by some at least, my concentration powers would have waned. So um, 
I'm sorry that you were inconvenienced, but sometimes, as you know only too well from your professional experience, these things happen. All right, Mr. Blake, where do we go now? Thank you. So um, can we take a 15-minute break, please? Yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, may I call Richard Morgan, please? Yeah. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Please do sit down. Uh, as you know, I am uh, Jason Beer. I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give us your full name, please? Richard Hugo Lyndon Morgan. Uh, thank you for coming to give um, your evidence to the inquiry today and for the provision of a witness statement previously. We're very grateful to you for the assistance that you are giving to this investigation. You should have in front of you a hard copy of that witness statement. I do. Um, it's in your name and dated the 19th of May, 2023. It is. If you turn to the last page of it, um, which is, I think, page 31, is that your signature? It is. Um, I think before I ask you whether it's true, to the best of your knowledge and belief, there are five corrections or amendments that you would wish to make. There are. Can we go through those, please? Um, I think the first is on paragraph three on page one. Is that right? Uh, yes, just as a matter of completeness. I also corresponded with Linklater's uh, and obtained confirmation from them that there was no uh, privilege maintained. And so in the first sentence there, uh, where you say, I have had uh, correspondence I've had with members of the legal team for the inquiry and my original instructing solicitors, Bond Pierce, now known as Womble Bond Dickinson, uh, you would add in, and also Linklaters. Yes. Thank you. And then um, on page 18, please. Yes, paragraph 56. Paragraph 56, thank you. Uh, what is the uh, amendment or addition that you wish to make to 56? Uh, so having seen further documentation since I produced this, uh, I now see, although I didn't remember at the time, that there was no expert evidence called at trial by either side. Thank you very much. Uh, you do say there, again, a review of the transcript of the hearing would confirm the position one way or the other, and you've now seen a transcript or a note I, of the I've trial. seen a transcript of one day of the hearing yes. and a note of the opening, or the morning of the opening. Thank you. Uh, I think the third um, correction or addition is page 21, paragraph 63. Yes. So in that paragraph, I talk about um, uh, the settlement discussions that were conducted between Bond Pierce and Mr. Castleton. I, I now see that I was actually copied in on emails which recorded that uh, the post office was seeking an undertaking from Mr. Castleton. Uh, I, I don't remember seeing those emails. Uh, sorry, I don't remember those emails from the time. Ha now, having seen them, I see that I did see the undertaking. I don't recall being asked or advising in relation to the undertaking, but I, did, I, I definitely did see those emails. Uh, thank you um, uh, very much. Uh, page 22, paragraph 65. Uh, yes, um, having now seen the transcript of one day of the hearing, uh, it reminds me or it records that uh, Mr. Castleton did ask for a break, at least on that afternoon, to take some medication, and I uh, asked the judge for an adjournment, and an adjournment was granted. So that relates to the, um, the last couple of sentences. I do not recall him ever saying to me personally he did, did he? Need, need a break or he yes. couldn't go on. Yeah. So um, now having seen the transcript, it reminds me that he must have asked me. Thank you. And then page 25, paragraph 77. Yes, there's a typo in the last sentence. Uh, it should say, I just do not think that person was me. So delete the first was. Yes. Thank you. With those amendments, are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are true, yes, to the best of my knowledge, information and belief. Can I start with your career qualifications and experience? Um, you're a barrister having been called to the bar in 1988, is that yes. right? Uh, you were appointed Queen's Counsel 
uh, as it then was <coughs> in 2011, yes. which is after most but not all of the events that we're going to look at, correct? Yes. And I think at all times relevant to the questions that I'm going to ask you, you practiced in Chancery, Commercial and Insolvency Law? Yes. Uh, you tell us that before the Lee Castleton case, you've been instructed by um, Tom Beezer of Bon Pierce. Yes. Um, but you believe this was your first instruction, the Castleton case. Is that right? Um, on behalf of the post office? Yes. And as it turned out, it was to be the first in a, um, a line of cases in which you were instructed by the post office after judgment was obtained um, against Mr. Castleton. I think that's right. I think that's putting a bit high. <coughs> um, I, I was approached on a number of subsequent occasions um, where an initial preliminary approach was made. I think there was only one case where I, I apparently produced a defence and counterclaim, but otherwise none of the other sets of instructions ever led to anything substantive. They're set out just so that we've got them, I think, yes. um, on page 29 of your witness statement. Yes, that's it. That's all I can see from my chamber's records, anyway. Just slow down a moment. The, it takes a little while for the, um, Sorry. Uh, the document to be displayed and therefore for people who aren't in the room who are following uh, to see it. So paragraph 91, you say, according to my chamber's fee system, I received the following other sets of instructions on behalf of the post office. Um, in 2007, a case called Aslam, when you um, gave some advice by telephone. Later in 2007, a case called um, Bilku, where you had a telephone um, conference and settled um, a defence and counterclaim. In well, I settled dra a draft particulars of defence and counterclaim. I don't have a record of ever settling the final version. Um, in 2011, you received instructions um, in uh, Scott Darlington and had a consultation um, in October and December that year. Yes. And then over the page, please. Um, you received instructions from the post office in a case called um, Prosser, and you gave some preliminary advice but then that wasn't followed up with instructions? No. Um, June 2012, a, um, a short telephone con uh, consultation, and we're going to look at that at a, at a moment. I'm not sure, was, it, was that a telephone con I'm not sure whether Sorry, that was a I, telephone consultation person. or a person. Quite right. Yes. Can we look at that, please? Of course. It's poll 406484. Um, you'll see that it's a Bond Pierce um, attendance note of a conference um, at your chambers, Maitland Chambers, on Tuesday the 12th of June 2012. And we can see that you are recorded as having been present, along with um, Daniel Margolian. Was he then a junior barrister from yes, your chambers? Was. Yes, he was. Um, a solicitor from Bond Pierce, <coughs> um, Gavin Matthews. Um, oh, I don't remember him. You don't remember him? No. I don't remember either of Susan Crichton or Hugh Flemington either. Um, if, if I can jog your memory at all, um, I will try it. Susan Crichton, an in-house solicitor at the post office. At that time, I believe she was post office's general counsel. Does that ring any bells? No. And Hugh Flemington, also um, an in-house solicitor at uh, Bond, uh, sorry, at the post office. Yes. If we just um, read through the attendance note, um, it was recognised that an impasse had been reached in relation to the Horizon litigation, which the Post Office is seeking to address. The question is, what is the best way of breaking that um, impasse? Do you remember that at this time, the litigation that is being referred to was a potential group action on behalf of a large number of so postmasters against the post office arising from action taken against them by the post office on the basis they said of faulty horizon data? No, I don't. Um, I received a copy of this document in the supplemental bundle 
last week or the week before, I went back and checked my chamber's records as to what was shown in relation to this con. I don't seem to have received um, any formal instructions in relation to it. There's no record of papers being delivered before the con occurred. Um, I, I seem to think, although I don't know why, is that Daniel Margolin was going to be instructed to produce a written opinion in relation to something. Um, but aside from that, that's uh, what's shown in this attendance note. That's the limit of my recollection, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I just, I just don't have any recollection. Of so you can't remember now the litigation um, which is referred to in that first? No. Nope. If we just, um, that first bullet point, if we just scroll down um, to see whether there's anything else that jogs your memory. Do you see at the end of the third bullet point, um, it um, says dot, 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 access legal will start to pursue all the civil cases they're currently sitting on. Do you remember a firm of solicitors called Shoesmiths? I who, know the name. You know the name of the firm? Yes. Uh, do you remember the um, firm of solicitors, Shoesmiths, who were um, acting, I think, then on behalf of um, five clients where they had delivered letters of claim and said that there were um, another 85 odd clients um, who they were consulting on um, in relation to potential claims. And Access Legal was the um, part of Shoesmiths, the branding part of Shoesmiths that was bringing the claim or threatening to bring the claims. I have no recollection of that at all. I mean, uh, uh, as I say, from my chamber system, it looks like um, there was a con booked. They turned up for 30 minutes. Um, my, my impression of all of the occasions on which the post office contacted me after Castleton was they wanted to see whether there was any um, expertise that I could bring to bear on their approach or their, their um, litigation that might assist. And they, on each occasion, I gave them pretty much the same answer. Let's look at um, what, what um, is recorded then. So we've read the first bullet point. The second bullet point, the proposal is to instruct an independent expert to prepare a report um, on the horizon system. Is the highest risk response to the issue? Does that appear to um, be you setting out or framing the issue for discussion, namely whether a, an independent expert should be instructed to report on the horizon system? I, look, I, I'm, I'm afraid I genuinely don't know because I've got no recollection and I don't think I got instructions. So whether this note is recording what I was being told or whether it's recording a conversation, I just don't know. Um, it, it continues. Um, what will it achieve? What will it achieve? It will not be able to address any of the civil or criminal cases dealt with under Old Horizon. Will it seek to review particular cases? Um, if so, um, which ones? Uh, would that have been your view at the time? Well, it seems a sensible expression of what it would achieve. So a series of hypothetical questions are, um, or questions are set out. What will it achieve? Will it be able to address the civil or criminal cases dealt with under old horizon? And will it be able to review particular cases? Mm. But would you agree that this note appears to record you um, questioning for these three wi reasons the wisdom of instructing an expert to produce a report. Yes, it's quite possible. But as I said, it, it's quite possible, but I just have no specific recollection, recollection of, of this meeting. Can we turn to the third um, bullet point? Whatever the findings of the expert report, it will not resolve the problem. 
the post office will be, quote, damned if they do and damned if they don't, end quote. If the findings are that there are no issues with Horizon, people will see that as a, quote, whitewash. Whereas if the findings are negative, that will open the floodgates to damages claims by sub-postmasters who were imprisoned for false accounting. And Access Legal will start to pursue all the civil cases they're currently um, sitting on. Again, do you think this paragraph um, uh, records uh, advice that you were giving? No. And the, the reason for that answer is I, I was just not intimately involved in prosecutions or other civil claims. You may not have been intimately involved. It may have been that people arrived at your chambers and um, asked you for a view on things over the course of half an hour. W why doesn't um, this uh, read as if it's you giving the advice? I don't know. I mean, it does, if you look at the bottom of that page, there, there is something that's attributed directly to me. I mean, uh, my, my problem, Mr. Beer, is I, I, I just have no recollection of this at all. The, the document says what it says. You can attribute to me um, the high-level answers if you want to, but um, I just don't remember saying it. That third paragraph that yes. we're, we're, we're looking at, do you now see any significant issue with the um, view that is recorded there? I agree that whatever the findings of the expert report, it won't resolve the problem. Um, I agree that it, the post office would be damned if they did and damned if they didn't. If it was a, a clean bill of health, then it would be a whitewash. And if, if it was negative, then obviously it would invite claims. I'm not sure about what the false accounting allegations to do with, because I'm not a criminal lawyer and I don't deal with those um, cases. If an independent expert said that there were problems with the integrity of Horizon, that might indeed open the way to damages claims. Absolutely. By sub-postmasters who had been um, convicted of criminal offences of forcing accounting on the basis of Horizon data. Mr. Beer, I, I don't know, because I wouldn't know the basis upon which convictions were obtained. Again, just looking at that paragraph, do, do you see any um, significant issues or problems with the advice that's being given there? I'm not sure that that's necessarily a fair question because I'm not sure that I'm giving the advice. I'm also not in a position to give any advice in relation to the criminal law aspects. What would have happened if they had started to discuss um, the impact of an independent report that showed that there were problems with Horizon data and that had consequences for um, the pursuit of civil claims that some solicitors were sitting on in a conference that you were um, uh, giving. Would you have said, stop, that's nothing to do with me. Well, I'm not a sorry. criminal law expert. I, I think you, if the question is read back, you'll find you asked me about in the context of civil claims. Yes. And then you've asked, what, you've, asked the sub, the, you've added to it what would the consequences be in relation to criminal claims? I don't advise on criminal law, no. and I would almost certainly have said I can't give you advice in relation to the criminal prosecutions. I'm not asking you about advice on criminal prosecutions, and this isn't anything to do with criminal prosecutions, this third bullet point. It's about civil claims arising from, um, from people who have been imprisoned, perhaps wrongfully. Uh, again, my, my answer would be the same, that I would feel decidedly uncomfortable and would, would almost certainly say that I'm unable to advise on civil claims arising from criminal prosecutions. It's just not an area of law in which I practice. 
Would you regard it as appropriate in commercial litigation involving a private corporation to advise that a step should not be taken because it might increase the number of claims brought against the private corporation? Yes. Uh, would your uh, view be that any different considerations apply if the putative defendant is a public authority or a public corporation? Potentially, yes. And what are those different considerations that apply if the putative defendant is a public authority or a public corporation? Well, one might want to think about what the, what the public law duties are of that um, public corporation, but I was being asked to advise a private company. Is that how you viewed the post office? Post Office Limited. You didn't see them as a public corporation? I didn't see them as a public corporation, no. Where the government holds the single share in the company on behalf of the public? I didn't see them as a public corporation governed by administrative law. And so, in the advice that, um, any advice that you gave on this occasion, you would have been approaching this as a, a commercial chancery litigator? Yes. And therefore, it would be appropriate to advise such a party that they should not take a step such as commissioning an expert report, even if it revealed that Horizon data was unreliable because that might open the post office to more damages claims. Yes, I think so. I think I would. I might be wrong in that, but... Can we read on? Um, it is said that post office will always have this problem. Some people will never trust computers and will always believe they have an inherent problem. Was that a view that you um, held at the time? I think it's likely that it would have been a view that I held at that time, yes. Uh, it continues, a less risky approach is to agree to take the relevant MPs privately through particular cases in which they um, are interested. Is that, um, given the limitations that you have expressed already on the type of role that you would perform, advice that you would give, or would have given? It, that's likely, yes. I mean, the, the problem with all of this is that my information, or the, the information provided to me, never extended to identifying specific problems. It was a generic, there's a problem with. Um, I never felt that any individual was ever going to answer everybody's concerns in a generic sense. And so if there were particular cases, then it was appropriate to examine those particular cases on an item by item basis. That's a different point to don't instruct an expert because it, the expert might uncover problems with Horizon and you will thereby face more claims, isn't it? Which seems to be the effect of the third bullet point. It does seem to be the effect of the third bullet point, but I'm not sure that that's quite what it's getting at. I mean, there are problems... With any computer system, there can be problems. There can be screen freezes, there can be loss of data, and so on and so forth, in, a, in a hy any hypothetical system. And I'm not, I'm just giving an example. Some of those problems might be quite innocuous. Some of them might cause no loss of data, no changes, whatever. But if you get a report that comes back and says, well, you get screen freezes or there are power cuts, then all that does is set a hair running. The only way to look at a problem like this, in my opinion, sitting here now, is to look at specific examples and work out what went wrong. And that seems to be what I'm articulating in the pre-penultimate paragraph, a less risky approach is to agree to take the relevant MPs privately through particular cases in which they're interested. 
So work through specific examples and see if there's a problem. But without the involvement of an, ex an independent expert? Well, there could be an independent expert. The note continues, um, the post office needs to engage with its stakeholders by perhaps sending out a questionnaire about Horizon to sub-postmasters, getting their views and seeking to address the more sensible ones. This is more a PX, PR exercise. Is that advice that you gave? I don't know. Would you understand a PR exercise to be something that is done to look good to the outside world? Yes. And to placate the sub-postmasters? Yes. Would you regard that as appropriate advice to give to a private corporation? No. Well, a, a private corporation wants to um, uh, keep its customer base happy. But a private corporation also wants to find out if there are problems with its systems. Now, if there are problems with, their, with, the, with your systems and the stakeholders express and articulate uh, what those problems are in a way that's identifiable, then, of course, you should engage with them. Uh, the last bullet point records that you're happy to discuss possible approaches and merits of each with the board um, of the post office at any time. Yes. That certainly suggests that no decision was reached in the course of uh, this consultation, if nothing else. Let me be frank, Mr. Beer. From what I can remember, which is close to nothing, as assisted by my chamber's records, some people turned up in chambers and we had a preliminary discussion about the possibility of being instructed. So um, the suggestion that this represents concluded, considered advice um, I think he's putting it a little high. I don't. Nobody suggested that, no. uh, other than you. <laughs> yeah, but you're, the way you're suggesting that this is a record of a definitive piece of advice given after a consideration, um, I think is perhaps a little unfair. We're working with what you and your instructing solicitors have given to us. Uh, those are not mine. Those are my former instructing solicitors. Can we turn to the Lee Carlton case? Of course. Uh, can we turn up paragraph? Sorry, I should also say that, as so far as I'm aware, I provided no documents to the inquiry no, I, because I, I didn't have any. No, I so, in so far as that question suggested that I had provided documents to the inquiry, it's based on a false premise. No, it was based on the correct premise that you've given no documents to the inquiry. Okay. That's why we're working with. Justice. So it's just the documents that my instructing, former instructing solicitors have provided. Correct. Can we turn to paragraph 25 of your witness statement on page 7, please? Yes. And if we just read paragraph 25 um, together, you say, um, nevertheless, at a very high level, the issue in the case, this is the Carston case, was whether there was a discrepancy of around £25,000 between first the cash and stock Mr. Carlston held at the end of the period when taken together with the cash sent back to the post office and all other receipts received from the post office from the branch. And secondly, the cash and stock Mr. Carlston was given at the start together with the cash and stock that he received whilst trading. If those cash and stock numbers could be established by reference to primary documents, then it was possible to prove what the correct figure before the closing balance should be forensically without reference to the horizon system, and hence whether there was a real as opposed to illusory um, discrepancy. Uh, just um, taking some parts of that, um, in the second line, um, cash and stock Mr. Castleton held at the end of the period. Was it your belief that um, evidence could be um, ascertained of those figures by um, counting and by documents other than documents produced by Horizon? Yes. Uh, reading on, when taken together with the cash sent back to the post office and all other receipts received from the post by the post office from the branch, again, um, was it your belief that those facts and matters could be established 
by counting or by documents other than documents produced by Horizon? Or does that in part depend on documents generated by Horizon? My difficulty at this um, remove in time is that I can't remember the format of the documents. Um, and I think also there may be a, a mismatch between the way the question is asked and, and the documents that we're referring to. There were documents that were printouts and those documents were vouched by Mr. Castleton on a regular basis, either daily or weekly. I am unclear in my own mind whether those were documents produced by Horizon that Mr. Castleton then verified, or whether they were documents produced by Mr. Castleton that Mr. Castleton then signed off on. That's an important, a very important distinction, given the um, legal case that you were um, to run at trial. I'm not sure that it was because a verification of a statement of account by an agent <coughs> carries the same implication as the document actually being produced by the agent, or at least that would, would have been my submission, I suspect, at trial. Reading on, um, uh, under the uh, second part of the sentence, Roman numeral two, the cash and stock that Mr. Carlsetum was given at the start um, as far as you can remember, was that um, a matter that could be ascertained without reference to the data produced by the Horizon system? Yes, I think so, because I think, and, and it's, it's something that I've, I've picked up rereading the transcript, I think there was a form P242 or something like that that, that was signed by the outgoing and the incoming sub-postmasters at the changeover of the accounting periods. Exactly, and then completing the rest of Roman uh, numeral two, together with the cash and stock that he received whilst trading, uh, that would have depended in part on records generated by Horizon, wouldn't it? Well, that goes back to the point about whether... What you can remember. Yes, and whether it was a record generated by Mr. Carsten or generated by Horizon that he then verified. You carry on um, if those cash and stock numbers could be established by reference to primary documents. Uh, sitting here now, can you remember whether those cash and stock numbers could all be established by reference to primary documents, i.e. other than documents produced by Horizon? So again, we're going to differ about what a document produced by Horizon is. Um, if Mr. Castleton has signed off on a document and said this is what had happened, then I would call that Mr. Castleton's document rather than Horizon's document. There's also a problem that in my own mind, I have this period of two to three weeks prior to the trial where I had volumes and volumes of documents that I went through and reconciled painfully by myself, but I can't remember what the documents were, only that I did undertake the exercise. And in, in my own mind, those are what I would call primary documents. So they were documents on which there was a manuscript verification by Mr. Castleton saying that effectively these figures are true. You say um, words to that effect in paragraph 26, if we just continue reading. Yeah, sure. I think that some of the primary documentation prepared by Mr. Castleton must have been provided um, to me at some point early on and I noticed that he signed off on daily and or weekly figures. Um, I can't remember exactly what documentation was produced. I only have some recollection that there was a body of accounting documentation and there were some manuscript documents. It therefore seemed to me that the deficiency could be proved by simply adding up all the manuscript figures produced and the calculations signed off by Mr. Castleton and without reference to any records produced only by a computer. Are you um, there saying that there was a manuscript record for each transaction, effectively a, a handwritten mirror 
or shadow of what was on horizon? No. And if I've given that impression, I'm sorry. If we go um, further on to paragraph 27... You say, um, in the second line, I recall there was a line of authorities in relation to accounts stated and settled accounts. When I researched that line of authorities, I realised there was authority for the argument that if Mr Castleton was tendering his own figures to poll, he was vouch uh, to the post office, he was vouching their accuracy. I therefore advise we should realign our pleaded case to take this point, and we should try to establish the true trading position by reference to Mr Castleton's own documents, by which I mean documents produced and or verified by Mr Castleton, rather than printouts from Horizon. And what if the printouts from Horizon were the documents verified by Mr Castleton? Well, then he was verifying their truth or accuracy as at that particular date. What if he was saying at the same time as verifying them, um, that these are not accurate, but I have got to verify them, otherwise I can't continue trading into the next trading period? Well, there you're asking me a hypothetical question. Do you not recall the evidence about the call, the calls, the many calls he made to the helpline? I, I do recall those. I also recall his evidence that each and every one of his uh, records of transactions at the end of the week were accurate. In that they recorded um, uh, discrepancies and shortfalls? In that they recorded the actual figures for the branch for that particular week. And he was uh, simultaneously phoning into the helpline and saying that the figures shown on these trading statements aren't the product of transactions conducted by me. His evidence at trial was that he had checked all the figures and they were true and accurate. And I put to him quite aggressively at one point uh, that in fact uh, he was making up the figures, for instance, for cash that he had received. And he maintained his position throughout, as he was uh, perfectly entitled to do, that his accounts were true and accurate. Now, of course, because of the way the case was pleaded, if his accounts were not true and accurate, uh, then uh, the entire matter would have gone off for an, a formal account to find out what the actual trading position had been throughout that period. But that turned out not to be necessary because his sworn evidence at trial was that the accounts were true and accurate. Uh, over the page, please, to paragraph 29. And scroll down a little bit. The last five or so, four or five lines, you say, instead, I needed physical records of cash and stock in, cash and stock out, and a calculation at the end of the day of what should be left after, after it had all been taken into account. If that was done, then it seemed to me that the operation of the Horizon system was irrelevant. That essentially developed into your principal case strategy, is that right? Yes. I just want to look at the reasons why you developed that um, uh, case strategy. Can we go back, please, to um, page six and the opening paragraph of, at uh, the opening part of paragraph 22? You say, it seemed to me it seemed obvious to me that trying to prove forensically that an entire computer network operated properly was going to be a very difficult, if not impossible, exercise. And it also seemed that Mr Castleton had not identified any mechanism by which errors were allegedly being generated. And then if we can look also at um, page 9... At paragraph 29, about halfway through, about seven or eight lines in, you say, trying to recreate an entire hardware and software system to replicate what was in place at the time of the relevant event would probably be extremely difficult, if not impossible. I didn't see how I could prove that there were actual losses by reference simply to what a computer printout said. And then page 10, please. At paragraph 33, about eight lines in, I think that I thought that even if the network could be reconstituted, I could not prove that it was impervious to external modifications. 
by which I mean hacking, unauthorized alteration, etc. I was generally concerned that if I was going to have to prove the case by reference to horizon logs, I wanted to know whether there were possible ways that the system could be manipulated, and I wanted to understand whether there was a context in which um, any other, and if so, how many incidents had been uh, reported. I don't recall ever being told that there were any incidents or weaknesses, and the issue seemed to fall away. And then lastly on this topic, um, page 13, please. Uh, paragraph 43. I thought it was difficult to prove a loss only by reference to the Horizon IT system, because in oral argument at trial, I'd be able to do no more than point to a computer printout and say that the printout showed that there was a loss. To my mind, that didn't prove a loss. It only proved what the sum of the figures produced by a machine showed when a calculation was undertaken and what figure was produced as a result of that um, uh, calculation. I referred you to four extracts from your witness statement saying in um, uh, roughly the same thing but amplifying um, in places um, the reasons. When you gave that advice to the post office, did anyone say, no, hold on, this is easy. We have um, um, people with expertise um, either in our organization or in Fujitsu who can prove the integrity of the Horizon system and the data that it produces? Uh, may I unbundle the question slightly? I'm not sure that I ever gave advice in strident terms that I couldn't prove it in that way. I think the advice that I gave is that there was a nice clean cut way through to the proof of the loss by going by way of account stated or um, uh, an agent's running account. Um, I think that um, a lot of what I've said there is, is my own internal thought process about how difficult it was going to be to prove the case if all I had was a piece of paper produced by a computer. Yes, there are provisions within the Civil Evidence Act that would have enabled me to rely on it, but it wasn't a very satisfactory way to go about um, formal proof of a loss. Um, sorry, can I... Can, well, yeah. Um, if we just go back to paragraph um, 33 on page 10, please. Sorry, can I just write something down? Because I'd like to go back on something. Yeah, of course. Sorry, paragraph 33 on page 10. Yes. At the um, second half of the paragraph, uh, where you say, I think, um, I thought that even if the network could be reconstituted, I couldn't prove it was impervious etc. Yes. You give um, essentially um, three questions that ought to arise, would this be right, if you're seeking to prove in legal proceedings a loss based on data produced by a computer. Um, there may be external modifications made to the system. The system may have been uh, manipulated. And what about other incidents that have occurred and may have been reported? Basically, yes. But we now know, through the judgments of Mr Justice Fraser in the Bates litigation, and in particular his Horizon Issues judgment, that there were, even by this time, um, a large number of bugs, errors and defects which afflicted the integrity of Horizon system and which either did or were capable of causing discrepancies and shortfalls in the financial and accounting records produced by horizon. When you um, advise the post office of this um, uh, legal approach, let's not seek to improve, uh, prove the integrity of the data that horizon produces. Let's rely on the accounts that Mr. Carlton has vouched safe. Did anyone from the post office say words to the effect of well, that's a relief, because in fact, we've got some bugs, errors, and defects in the system. Absolutely not. Um, I, I, and I think by way of clarification of your question, I don't think I ever put it as, let's avoid using the Horizon system as a means of proving the case. It was, this is a nice, straightforward um, way of proving the loss. So 
I, I wasn't com comparing and contrasting the two positions. I think what happened, I think what happened sitting here now is that I recognised that there were going to be problems proving the case in one way, and I suggested that a, a, an agent's account was a better way of dealing with it, or that that was the way to prove the case. I'm not sure that at the time I said or gave advice to post office that they shouldn't use Horizon because of the difficulties, but they should use the agent's account. I just simply said, you should use the agent's account route. And when you um, put it in that more um, simplified um, form, did anyone say, well, that's good because we may have some real issues in being able to evidence and or prove that the post office has suffered a genuine loss here no, as opposed didn't. to it being an artefact of the system? No, they didn't. Uh, in fact, uh, at all times, there had been a... Well, professed to me had been a high degree of confidence that Horizon was a sound system. And so nobody said, your, your nice legal point, Mr Morgan, is of therefore real practical help to us, because otherwise we may be in difficulties in proof. No. And so um, your um, evidence is that you came up with the nice legal point because not of any actual knowledge about problems with Horizon, but because you presumed that there would be such problems, or at least it would be difficult to show that there weren't such problems. Yes. It's just to, it's a £25,000 claim and a computer system like Horizon struck me back in 19, sorry, 2006 as being a huge beast with all sorts of things that were going on, not the least of which would be upgrades to software, dropping out of... Um, dial-up networks or ISDN or ADSL or whatever was being used at the time. Um, so why have a difficult case when you can have an easy case? Did anyone say, well, hold on, um, in criminal proceedings, Mr Morgan, we don't do it that way. We have to prove the integrity of the Horizon system. And we do that by calling evidence to show the integrity and accuracy of the data that Horizon produces. No. I don't remember anybody ever, ever talking me through what was going on. I don't even... I don't even remember people telling me about criminal proceedings, if I'm right. I, I, I can't recall any occasion in which anybody ever talked about how they did things in criminal trials or even the existence of criminal trials. Would you agree that the post office um, should not have proceeded with a civil claim had they um, been genuinely concerned that the loss alleged was not a genuine loss or an actual loss to them? Sorry, so you're asking me a hypothetical question. I, I, I'm yes, that sometimes I, happens. <laughs> Sorry. And I realised I was asking it, so there's probably no need to tell me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Beer. Um, I think from, ethical, um, from an ethical position, I would have been in some difficulty if I thought that I was being asked to run a case that my um, lay client had no belief in the um, integrity of the underlying claim. So, yeah. so, so had, you, had that been put to you, um, what would you have advised? I can't continue to act. I'd have withdrawn, I think. And it would have been... Depend, depending on quite, quite how it came out, but I, yeah. I would have been decidedly unhappy. Um, it it the would therefore least. have altered your advice that the post office should simply rely on the signed cash accounts of Mr Castleton. I think I would have told them they'd have to discontinue if they didn't think there'd been a genuine loss. And so if you had found out before the trial that um, data produced by Horizon that um, formed uh, the basis of signed cash accounts uh, was unreliable or may have been unreliable, what would your advice have been to the post office? I would have wanted to look quite carefully at what was being said by Mr. Castor. And, and indeed, the note, the note that I took uh, earlier when I said, could I just write something down, in, was, in, in fact, something that came back to mind. Um, so the, the pleadings in this case were quite unusual in that um, 
the accuracy of Mr. Castleton's signed figures was positively averred by him in the pleadings. Do you have the defence, by any chance? We, um, we do. Um, we've got the amended defence. Yes, that, that's what I was thinking um, of. LCAS 40294. Thank you. And if we flip to the um, next page, the next page, you'll see the substance of the amended defence defence and counterclaim. Uh, yeah, that's not the relevant paragraph. If you go to the next page, you might be thinking of six. No, uh, sorry. Can you go back up the page, please? Yeah, it's paragraph three. And what's the point you're making on the basis of paragraph three? Um, he, he's admitting that he's producing these accounts. And then if we look at paragraph 7a, The said cash account for week 51 is not an account stated behind which the, um, the defendant is not entitled to go, and then some reasons are set out. Yes. It doesn't constitute an absolute acknowledgement over the page. All of the accounting uh, in it was done by the defendant, uh, not the claimant. The claimant doesn't um, allege that the account was approved by it. The claimant does not allege the account was entered into it. Um, as agreed in its books, nor recognised by it in some way as correct. Yes. I think you've got to read 7A with three. But quite possibly. But the, the fact of the matter is that there was no dispute as between the parties that um, the documents upon which the claimant was relying in the case were documents produced and verified by Mr Castleton personally. And so you develop this strategy. That document can come down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at essentially an abstract or um, academic level, yes, be not because of anything you've been told about the practical difficulty of proving the accuracy of data produced by Horizon. That's correct. Uh, can we look, please, um, at WITN 046, 0046, 0100? It's Mr. Dilly's witness statement from whom we've just um, heard, and he was uh, one of your instructing solicitors. And can we just look at page 34, please? And look at paragraph 67. And it, it just scroll up just so you can get the date. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A conference on the 11th of September at um, your chambers. He says in 67, at that point in time, we were considering and developing case strategy. I can see from the note, we believe we had a difficulty proving the loss. From memory, this was not because those instructing us had any doubt that there was a loss. It was rather a question of how it could be demonstrated. Uh, from my note and distant recollection, I believe it was in part because Miss Oglesby had told us that a sub-postmaster could change data inputted into Horizon after the event. One idea council had was we should take the starting position by way of an opening audit and the ending position, a closing audit, and seeing what the difference was. One alternative was to rely on the admission in the cash accounts that Mr. Castleton had signed. Hmm. This um, evidence seems to suggest that the nice legal point that I've um, been calling it was a consequence of a difficulty or a belief in a difficulty in proving the loss. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes, I can. Was that something that was made clear to you? Never mind your nice legal point, Mr mm. Morgan. There is, in fact, a difficulty in proving losses using Horizon.
I don't remember that forming any part of my thought process. Oh, sorry, I don't, I don't remember a specific fact of anybody saying the sub postmaster could change the data and put it into Horizon was, was part of the consideration. I, th I think in my witness statement I'd already said that I was concerned about whether data could be changed. But um, you've pitched that at a, um, a theoretical, yes. any computer system can have data changed. Yes, rather um, than, a, 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 than a, oh, this is what somebody is going to say in this case. Yeah. Also, well, I mean, Mr. Dilley says what he says, but why would a sub postmaster change the data to show that he owed money to the post office? But there we are. Um, anyway, so, there we are. That, that's what he says. So you say that, um, in fact, you developed this point uh, at the abstract or academic level, not because of the kind of thing that's recorded here, that there was actually a difficulty in proving the loss on this system. As I sit here now, Mr. Beer, yes, that, that's my recollection. I, I don't have any recollection of developing it as a responsive strategy. I, my recollection, correct or incorrect, perfect or imperfect, is that this was a high-level theoretical issue. Can we look, please, at poll 3071081? Um, this is an email dated the 21st of August 2006, and you are neither a sender nor a recipient, but it refers to your view or something that you are said to have said. If we just look under overview. Yes. So this is Mr. Beezer writing to Ms. Tolbert, copying Mr. Dilly in. Richard Morgan believed the case to be one with a good chance of success, but he did warn that was dependent upon the accountancy evidence stacking up in our favour. I return to this below, and also upon acceptance of the cost in taking this matter to trial. Uh, we have discussed cost, bef cost before. Uh, I also return to this point below. Um, a further point made by Richard Morgan was that we should endeavour to move the main area of focus in the case away from the horizon system, if possible. Richard suggested a method to do that would be to prove, if possible, the physical cash losses at the Marine Drive branch by reference to all the other documentation created around the transactions, not simply by reference to what was in fact recorded on the horizon system. So, for example, when a cheque is deposited there, um, is, as I understand, a counterfoil filled out, which is sent off daily by the sub-postmaster, with all checks eventually ending up at EDS. If the horizon system was later found not to match the physical remittances, an error, note is, error notice is generated. One of the issues in this case is that there were few error notices generated, suggesting that the physical remittances uh, did match the horizon inputs. Clearly, to attempt to look into such matters in the level of detail likely to be required will be costly and um, time-consuming. And then if we just look at the um, foot of the page, please. Um, one other point raised by Richard was the integrity of the Fujitsu product generally. Uh, just to confirm, I understand that Royal Mail Post Office know of no issues with the Fujitsu system and are confident it operates correctly. Um, please discuss with me if you have a different over the page view. Thank you. If we just go back to the end of the third paragraph, please, on page one. I'll just scroll up a little bit. Thank you. So the paragraph beginning a further point. Mm -hmm but we should endeavour to move the main area of focus away from um, horizon, if possible. And then at the end of the paragraph, um, one of the issues in this case is that there were few error notices generated, suggesting phys physical remittances did match the horizon um, inputs. But on the post office's um, case, uh, i.e. that Mr. Horizon had made genuine losses. Sorry, Mr. Castleton had made genuine losses. Yes, Mr. Castleton had made genuine losses. Would that absence of error notices suggest a, 
and unreliability of the horizon reporting, as you understood it? No. Why not? Because the absence of error notices, according to this note, suggests that the physical remittances did match the horizon inputs. Isn't that a problem on the case, that there was a match between the actual cash and the inputs? Mm, not that I understand. Look, sorry, I'm trying to reconstruct what, what was going on a long time ago. I understand. Um, I, I, and this isn't my note, and I don't know what this is, what this, how, it, how it all works, but um, I, I thought the, the, the fact was that um, the um, horizon inputs did match up with what Mr. Castleton was signing off, and that did, at the end of the day, show that there was a loss. And so the fact that there were a few error notices suggested that the figures produced by Horizon uh, and the figures produced by Mr. Castleton were, were the same and uh, did show a loss. But, you know, that, 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 that's by the by, isn't it? Um, Can I attempt to move things on and look at some um, um, evidence of what was and was not disclosed to you about any bugs, errors, and defects in um, uh, Horizon and the data produced by it? Uh, we've looked already, no need to turn it up, at paragraph 33 of your statement, where you say you don't recall ever being told about any incidents or weaknesses with Horizon. Can, can, just can I just cl clarify that slightly? Um, I, I then go on to say that other, there were occasions when screens had frozen or whatever, but nothing ever specific, and nothing in relation to Marine, uh, Marine Drive. Can we look, please, at poll 307 2741? Uh, this is an attendance note of the 16th of August 2006, um, held between you and your instructing solicitor, of a conference held between you and your instructing solicitors um, that day. If you just scroll down a little bit, you can see the context. Uh, you discuss next um, key dates, and then you, um, on the first page, run through the particulars of claim with you outlining some passages, and then um, your clients or solicitors um, referring to some um, answers or uh, comments upon them. And then if we go over the page, please. Uh, the same is um, done on the defence. And then on page three, uh, the reply to the defence. Uh, same on page four. And then if we go to page five, um, it appears that you started um, to um, discuss the witness evidence. Can you see under the heading of John Jones. Yes. And then if we scroll down, no, we've got it there, thank you. Do you see under the third paragraph, under the heading um, John Jones, there's mm -hmm. a passage with an asterisk, an RM, which I think um, in context refers to you. Yes. Uh, you're recorded as uh, saying, we need to know what sort of security or protection Marine Drive had on its dial-up internet. Was it password protected? And then this, can Fujitsu get in and change the raw data after Castleton um, inputted this? Mm -hmm. And so you were, would you agree, asking some um, difficult but reasonable questions of the post office here, and in particular, can Fujitsu get in and change data after Mr. Castleton has inputted it? Yes. Uh, would you agree that that's a, um, a question that any person presenting evidence originating from a computer and which they rely on to prove a loss would have to ask um, uh, in court proceedings? Um, I'm going to give you a one word answer, which is no. Yes. I'm going to go on to explain because in civil litigation it's an adversarial system and each side depends, or each side's arguments are responsive to those made by the other side. So in, at the end of the day, it would depend how Mr. Castleton articulated his case as to why he said errors were being created by Horizon. But before I went, before I went anywhere near 
um, taking a case forward on the basis of a single category of evidence. I wanted to understand what the, what the weaknesses might be and what um, landmines might lie in my path to, to the trial. So at this stage, I'm trying to flesh out where could this all go wrong for me? Did you ever get an answer back to that uh, question? Not that I recall, no. no. And I can say there doesn't appear to be one recorded in the yes. papers, as far as I, I can see. That's obviously not definitive. You, you asked whether Fujitsu could um, change uh, data. Yes. Um, uh, essentially. Um, we now know that Fujitsu could um, amend data and that for a period of time there was an unaudited and unauditable method uh, of them doing so. Would you expect that information to have been revealed to you in answer to your direct question? I think I would have liked to have known it. What would you have done if you'd been told Fujitsu can get access to the system to change data I... and there's not a method of auditing when and in what circumstances they've done so? Um, I, I, I think I would have wanted to take a good hard look around the second-hand motor vehicle I was being sold as the post office's case and kick the tyres rather more carefully, to use a, a metaphor. Um, I, 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 I think I would have felt decidedly uncomfortable at the very least and would have change the dynamic of the inquiry that I was making and the advice that I was giving. I think. With that... Um, that's, again, hypothetical, an answer to a hypothetical question. But um, on the fortunately very few occasions when um, litigants have revealed uh, extremely adverse information, it, uh, it rather alters the dynamic between counsel and lawyers. With that um, striking metaphor in our minds, um, I wonder whether we could um, take the lunch break. As you know, sir, we're breaking early at 5 to 12 today and coming back at 5 to 1. Yeah, that's fine, uh, Mr. Beer. 5 to 1. Would you be kind enough to give me the usual warning, just so that it's on the record? I will. Um, I think that you are well aware that you should not... Uh, speak to any about, anyone about the evidence uh, which you have given and which you may give this afternoon. But I should tell you that you shouldn't discuss your evidence with anyone. And um, I think that's a sufficient warning for someone who is King's Counsel. Thank you. So five to one. Thank you.